malware has been infecting computer networks for decades. It, it appears a lot of similarities to the notion of a weapon. That weapon is usually associated with credit card fraud and peeping toms, but now it's also increasingly used by government and law enforcement agencies around the world. And the targets are often not criminals, but activists, dissidents, and even journalists. Governments are spying on people who are trying to stand up. The old hacker joke is that code moves faster than law. We don't have any sane policy governing this right now. And that's, that's an issue. I feel it is as aggressive as the Olympic Turks. Having things yanked out of your hands is the same feeling. Inside one of the most revealing hacks of the year and the fight for truth about the secret and highly lucrative business of state-sponsored spyware. followed in, in every move. 
I remembered my mother went to get, I think a birth certificate from the local office and she was taken apart by one of the officers and he showed her a file that was filled with my information. And he said, this is your daughter. We have all this information on her. By the way, we're also watching your house and how she goes in and out and her every move. During this time, over two dozen organizers, including Samia and Virginia, were sent a mysterious email. So the email says, you know, I have this scoop. I think you guys would be interested in checking it out and publishing it. And then it was attachment. The email caught our attention because it included the, the word scandal. It looked like it was something that somebody leaked some important information for us. There was people who did open it up. What they opened was unusual, a word document, but it was blank. When they did download it, people started raising alarms. People started sending emails in that thread saying, don't open this attachment. I think there's something wrong with it. I remember that really scary moment. I got really freaked out. There was this heightened sense of paranoia. Chilled by what they believed to be a government attack on their computers, Samia and Zeynab wanted to be sure, so they reached out to someone they thought could help. I've been doing a work through Citizen Lab on tracking the commercial digitized surveillance market. And so we heard that the Moroccans have been targeted. Morgan Marquibois and Bill Marzak are researchers with Citizen Lab. Citizen Lab is a group of researchers focused on uh, internet freedom issues. I basically work on government surveillance issues. What are governments around the world doing? What technology are they using? And how are they trying to infiltrate and spy on opposition movements? Well, I actually ended up talking to Zenib, and I ended up getting from them the original email that they'd been sent, as well as the scandal.doc the lure document, right? The bait. Analyzing that bait meant entering a world that's become a kind of wild west of state surveillance and mercenary contractors. Opening this document actually facilitated the installation of sort of a multi-stage piece of malware, and it was, it was professionally written. One of the things that I've observed is that the spyware communicated with a command and control server, which we were able to link to a command and control server inside Morocco. The link to the Moroccan Command and Control Center appeared to confirm the first part of their mystery. The evidence did suggest that this was the Moroccan government who was using this. I felt that my private life was out there. The feeling of being watched all the time is something that is wrong. It's very aggressive. It is as aggressive as being beaten or having things yanked out of your hands. It's the same feeling. I was one of the only ones at the time who lived in the United States. When I received this malware, I realized I am just as much a target as someone in Morocco is. I definitely believe this malware was a way of unmasking people, and for those that were already unmasked, to threaten them, scare them. Every social movement starts with a private conversation, and if those private conversations can't happen because either your government or a foreign government is always listening, then it really starts to impact democracy. That impact was felt by the Moroccan activists. The protests were starting to slow down, and with the regime attacking us from so many angles, the slowing down was bound to happen. But for Citizen Lab, there was a bigger question. Who was making the intrusive malware? And how did the Moroccan government obtain it? Hidden deep in the code was a stunning answer. There's this company out there which is in broad daylight selling hacking tools saying, hey guys, there's a problem and the solution is you need to hack people. Here's a way to eliminate... The Citizen Lab team had found strong evidence that the hostile malware targeting activists Samia and Zeynab had come from inside the Moroccan government. But they still wanted to know where the Moroccans had obtained such sophisticated malware. A word document is generally not seen as something that could infect you. Uh, but, it, but in this case, uh, it contained an exploit which would have installed the spyware on their computer. 
the sample that was used to target the Moroccans was almost identical to another sample which talked to a domain which was demo.hackingteam.it. Hacking Team is one of a number of companies active in the global covert market of malware. What Citizen Lab found was a digital footprint that appeared to link the company directly to the attack on Sami and Zainab. If you're a government, you don't have to be particularly competent. You can just call up Hacking Team, order this solution, and, you know, they'll, they'll walk you through how to use it. Walking governments through how to spy on their own citizens has become a lucrative business. Hacking Team sells their products with slick advertisements. Is passive monitoring enough? You need more. You want to look through your target's eyes. You have to hack your target. This is Hacking Team's Dark Secrets video. It's a pitch to move beyond passive surveillance, move beyond wiretapping, move beyond network monitoring, and actually hack the phones and computers of the people you're targeting. That, I think, is the very striking development. That there's this company out there which is, in broad daylight, selling hacking tools, saying, hey guys, the pro there's, there's a problem, and the solution is you need to hack people. Rely on us. Citizen Lab was gathering growing evidence that Hacking Team was selling their software on nearly every continent, including to some of the world's most oppressive regimes, who were using it to target journalists and dissidents. Reporters Without Borders even dubbed the company an enemy of the internet. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had already weighed in on the dangers of companies selling surveillance technology to dangerous regimes. When companies sell surveillance equipment, to the security agency of Syria or Iran or in past times Gaddafi, there can be no doubt it will be used to violate rights. It's like you sell someone uh, a weapon, like maybe you sell M16s to a particular agency and a government ostensibly to fight drug trafficking, and then they can go out and use those M16s against protesters in the streets. Businesses like Hacking Team found themselves under pressure to answer for how their spyware was being used. Their marketing head, Eric Rabe, was confronted at an internet security conference in 2013. You guys help people break into people's computers. We help people to protect their privacy. I mean, I know people that have been put into prison and who have been tortured because of this stuff. Just straight up. I understand you. You've you asserted that over and over and over. I understand your, that's your point of view. I don't agree. No, it's not a point of view. It's a fact that people well, have been tortured like by brain. Well, it's a fact that people have been tortured almost in every country in the world. So that's not, you know, that's not an argument. After this confrontation, Hacking Team's representatives kept themselves largely out of sight. But in an interview with us, Eric Rabe defended their company's products, saying they are important law enforcement tools. We consider it surveillance software. We think the use of it is perfectly legitimate. We have no embarrassment about what we do, and we're pretty open about what we're selling. We uh, have no secrets to hide here. But it turned out Hacking Team did have secrets. Lots of them. Just one month after this interview, Hacking Team got a taste of its own medicine when over 400 gigabytes of company information was hacked. Startling revelations about the company were dumped online. My cell phone explodes and I have all these text messages of people who are like, oh my god, you have to get online. You really need to see this. It's been sold and oversold as the key to a better future. And something's gone very wrong with it. The rise in student tuition is unsustainable. The average American student now graduates more than $25,000 in debt. I want this for my kids. It's just too bad it costs $60,000 a year. What is happening to higher education? It is not good for America. It's not good for the young people. Activists had long suspected that Hacking Team and its competitor companies like Gamma Group were selling spyware to some of the world's most brutal dictatorships. But those companies kept their client lists a closely guarded secret. Until a Sunday in July 2015 when the internet lit up with news of a massive hack. My cell phone explodes and I have all these text messages of people who are like, oh my god, you have to get online. You really need to see this. Hacking Team's been hacked. This is the big news. What happened was so 400 gigs of documents, including the, the entire mail, the whole company, was leaked onto the internet. So, I mean, this, this you know, sort of gave us visibility into the inner workings of the software. Obviously, their business dealings were kind of...
countries around the world, who they sold to. The leaked documents suggested hacking team sales to repressive regimes around the world were even more widespread than anticipated. I, I think there was 38 client countries of hacking team enumerated in the dump. Some of the more interesting ones, obviously, is Ethiopia, Bahrain, Egypt, Kazakhstan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Morocco. This was a very different story than we were told a month before the hack in our interview with hacking team spokesperson, Eric Rabe. We, uh, of course, take some pains to examine the potential clients before we even make a deal with them to make sure that they're people that we feel comfortable doing business with. When Eric Rabe says, oh, we very carefully bid our customers, I have to wonder what type of bidding process they use when Sudan can sail through it so easily. Rights abuses in Sudan were so bad, the UN had begun an investigation into hacking team sales to the country, warning against possible violations of the arms embargo in place against the Sudanese government. The company also insisted that their tools are only for finding criminals. The reality is that in a world where a lot of people are doing bad things using digital technologies on the internet, uh, the police, law enforcement agencies around the world need to be able to do what they've always done, which is follow that activity. But even their spokesperson admits they have no way to confirm how their spyware is used. When we equip a law enforcement agency with this tool, they do the investigation, not hacking team. So we're not privy to who they're investigating or how they're deploying the software. The result of that is that there's a limit to how much we can know about what they're actually using the software for. If you're in the business of selling people weapons, and make no mistake about it, malware is a weapon, then you have to have that obligation. Otherwise, honestly, I don't know how you sleep at night. The standards here in the U.S. are not the standards in every country. And one person's, uh, you know, terrorist is another person's journalist or a uh, freedom fighter. These companies are simply just selling their, their software, their spyware, where the money is. They're not necessarily concerned about the consequences because they don't have to answer to anyone. Nobody's going to slap them with sanctions or, or fines or penalties for, for selling to a country like this. The 400 gigabyte trove of leaked hacking team documents also shined a light behind the scenes of a company working hard to justify what they were doing, while leaked invoices showed just how much their pockets were being lined in the process. But the biggest revelations by far were yet to come. A massive trove of hacked documents revealed that the company Hacking Team was selling malware to some of the world's most brutal dictatorships. But the big surprise was the identity of one of their biggest customers. We knew that Hacking Team was likely trying to sell inside the United States and they had opened an office um, here, but the fact that it wasn't just the FBI, it was multiple agencies and local law enforcement was um, surprising. The dump actually revealed that Hacking Team had successfully sold their software to uh, the FBI, the DEA, and the U.S. Army. They'd pitched to a variety of other organizations under you know, various entertaining codenames. The DEA's customer name was, was Katie, the FBI's customer name was Phoebe. They attempted to sell to the CIA, who I believe did not conclude the purchase. They also um, pitched their software to uh, various other law enforcement agencies around the U.S., including district attorneys in uh, New York, San Bernardino, in Arizona, in Florida. They were very active in the continental U.S. So many secrets were revealed by the data hack that the company temporarily asked its customers to stop using its products. After the hack, one of those customers, the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, even sent a letter to Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley saying they'd severed ties with the company. Federal law enforcement declined our request for an interview, but evidence suggests the global market for government-sponsored malware has barely skipped a beat. Business in the clandestine market is as strong as ever, and the public is still mostly kept in the dark. At the moment, we have no idea how widespread the law enforcement use of surveillance software actually is. The old hacker joke is that code moves faster than law. We don't have any sane policy governing this right now. That's, that's an issue.
here because you're the one who said that I should move here at some point. I know. And now you're leaving me. For Samia, being the target of a malware attack on U.S. soil only strengthened her resolve. The day after she finished graduate school, she began to pack for a one-way trip back to the fight for human rights. Part of the decision of wanting to go back is, you know, to be on the ground, to stand side by side by the people that I view as my comrades. I think I can only be effective by being there. Where an activist continues to live in one of these places where they're under threat, under surveillance, under physical threat, requires a lot of courage. But I think they see the payoffs as much, much bigger than the risks that they endure. I am worried. I'm worried because we're essentially switching places. But if I don't go back, what in the thing is going to change? Everything's just going to stay the same. I don't think I've ever gone back to Morocco with this much uh, insecurity and unsureness of what might happen. Oh, take care. Thank you. More and more we live in a society where it's possible to live a lot of our lives online. So it enables a new type of, of really powerful digital activism. But it's also very dangerous. There's a dark side to this technology in that it's very, very easy to spy and surveil on this. So I think it's really, really important for people around the world to have this debate about whether these tools should be legal, in what cases they should be used, and how we should you know, reason about this as a society. Forces are shaping our digital world, some of which are not acting in our best interest. And so we need to participate. You've got to build a world that you want to live in.